What is up, everyone? Welcome to DC Standom, your guided tour of the DC multiverse. I'm your host, Mike Cicchini, the editor-in-chief of DennyGeek.com. And each week, I'm bringing you discussions with writers, artists, actors, and experts, covering everything from DC Comics to the movies and TV that make up the DCU. This week, we have an in-depth conversation with Jeremy Adams, writer of DC's brand new Green Lantern title, and who is currently bringing to a close an epic run on Wally West with The Flash, and who has another Flash-centric title on the horizon in October with a book focused on Jay Garrick. As we record this, it is actually Green Lantern number one release date, is it not? I know, it's crazy. A lot of, uh, a lot of fear-based emotions going on here. <laughs> were there fear-based emotions when you were first offered, uh, you know, uh, as high profile a character as Hal Jordan, just as you were wrapping up a massive flash run. Yeah, it was, it was a combination of sorrow and excitement, <laughs> you know, and I'm one of those people I get kind of myopic and I remember being like, Oh, I'm so sad and kind of down on myself. And then we were driving to my in-laws, which is like three hours away or something. And I got in the car. I talked to Jeff Johns, who was just like, this is awesome. I, evidently, I'm on the Jeff Johns track for some reason. I don't know what's going on, but he was super pumped. And by the time I got to uh, my in-laws, I kind of figured out what I wanted to do, what the story was I wanted to tell. And, I, and then I started getting really excited about it. Let's talk about that story. And it's funny that you mentioned Jeff Johns because Jeff, to me, was the writer who really just foregrounded the outer space elements of green yeah. lantern like more than they ever had been you know in in my lifetime when i was reading the book but now with your book it's it's an earthbound setting at least at the start it feels to me a little bit more like kind of like that post crisis early 90s green lantern run uh which is where i really kind of first fell in love with the character so why don't you why don't you tell me about you know placing hal back on earth and everything that comes along with that. Paul Kaminsky, who's my editor, said that they really wanted to get to kind of a back to the basics, you know, how a how on earth idea. And I had had a pitch, uh, um, I don't know, a while ago that fit, it fit perfectly. It was kind of a, a thought I had in my head and I kind of built it out because just him being on earth is not a story in itself. So it's like, why is he on earth? How does he stay on? Because I'm like you, I, I think the, the temptation I have because I grew up reading, you know, Jeff John's Green Lantern and Tomasi's like Green Lantern Corps, like that one two punch that was just out and it was every month it was just like, this is awesome. This is this is Star Wars and Star Trek combined. And it was incredible. And I think the temptation for me, at least, would be, um, yeah, yeah, it's great here. I got to go, <laughs> you know, and that, that would just be my temptation. So putting some some constraints on that and how that actually relates to a story uh, became really fun and it also forced me to focus a little more on Hal's character and what Hal's doing and I remember the first thought I had was I wonder how much Hal has in his bank account like that was the first thought like he's been got for so much what does he have $13 in his bank account what's going on and that kind of helped me think about what it's like to just come home again what it's like to come you know he's he's been leading and patrolling and you know, fighting cosmic forces for a long time and the mundane of Earth, or at least, you know, I think presupposed mundane, it's got to be hard. And the woman that he really loves that's been on and off again, off again, because of the tumultuous uh, nature of his occupation is moving on. And, and, and he has to struggle with like, I like her. I, you know, I'm kind of, pursuing her but at the same time is it right for me to do so you know is it right for me to put her in this situation into a relationship that's as volatile as it is so those are some of the kind of character questions i want to i want to move forward in the book but anytime you take on one of these characters at least this is like my second time really being able to touch one of the bigger characters and uh, i think there's a tremendous amount of pressure <laughs> i mean i'm excited about it but oh I am very well aware <laughs> of the pressure that's involved. I feel like there is always, there's a certain natural, synergy is not the right word. I, I'm a writer, I should know words and I'm not knowing <laughs> them very well right now. But there's a certain, I don't know, almost like a parallel track with Flash and Green Lantern. I feel like yeah. those characters, for as different as they are, 
and the like they each come with so much mythology and can just completely populate an entire superhero universe into themselves right yeah. but there is something that has always made those two characters fit well together and it's not just the color schemes but like and i can't put my finger on it but it, for some I reason think- it makes you going from flash to green lantern feel like a natural thing yeah but i don't know if there's any way you can elaborate on this yeah, connection I, or if i'm just imagining it no 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 i think i think they're kind of every men in a way it's not like you know their trauma and their their road to superhero didn't start early age like wonder woman batman or superman like they've always had you know kind of well, at least with batman his like determination to become this thing happened very early and superman obviously was born with it and then wonder woman was born with it there's this kind of element of like they're born into this godhood in a way, right? Whereas Hal Jordan and and Barry or Wally, that came later. You know that they were they had somewhat traditional, I mean, you know, upbringings. You know, I know that Hal had the trauma of his father's death, but you know that's that's everyday life. He didn't get the chance to become the Green Lantern until much much later. So I don't know. I always feel like there's a relatability. There's a certain amount of humanity to them that some often is overlooked or not necessarily touched upon with Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Not to say they don't have humanity, it's just they have to deal with all these other things around them. So there's a little bit of like, oh, they're just dudes, you know? Even even if Barry is, you know, a scientist and, uh, uh, you know, works for the police department, he's still a dude. Uh, he doesn't have a billion dollars in the bank. Um, he doesn't, he's not bulletproof, you know, all that stuff. I think... I think that that's that nature versus versus nurture argument. But that's why I feel like there is some sort of relatability. What you're picking up on is something that I've thought about is that Hal is this kind of overconfident schlub in a way, but he does have this amazing heart and he's very self-confident, but there are certain things in his life that, you know, for such a self-confident person, I think looking around and seeing the world moving on without him is a blow to his ego in a lot of ways, you know? He was back in the day being a hot shot test pilot, all that stuff. It's great, you know, but it, as you see in issue number one, the world's moved on a bit. Like that's almost like being like, I was the best buggy driver that it ever existed. And people are like, buggy driver? No one uses buggies. <laughs> you know? This issue has, you know, a lot of Hal and it has a lot of Carol, mm-hmm. but, you know, there's no guardians. They're only kind of referred to, obviously. Right. The Manhunters are, you know, kind of there in spirit with, mm-hmm. you know, with with the antagonist who's briefly introduced in this issue. Right. Um, you know, it seems like there is like a very do- even the way Hal confronts that guy is is very kind of direct and, you know, non-powered and, you know, at <laughs> right. least initially. So you know, what, what is your mission here? Like how far back do you want to strip Green Lantern back to the, the essential qualities of how Mm -hmm. before you start bringing back other elements of Green Lantern mythology? And I'm sorry if that comes off like a loaded question. It's not my intention. No, 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 no. I mean, listen, the reality is even when I was dealing with the flash, the amount of mythology and massive continuity and all that stuff that existed the flash was a lot and you know i think green lantern might be a little more complicated in some ways but in order my belief is in order for the reader to come along for all that mythology that potentially will come and i say potentially is they've got to care about the character and i saw this very you know there's a lot of green lanterns there's a lot of green lanterns 2814 and for some reason, people really started hating Hal. <laughs> and I always felt like it was my mission statement to be like, I want you guys to like this guy. I want you to like him so much that when we start introducing pieces of that that mythology back in, um, you care. Because without without caring about him, no one's going to care about the mythology. You can do it all you're blue in your face. It's not going to matter, at least to me. And um, I think the mythology is grand. And I also think that at the end of Jeff Thorne's run, there's a lot of loose threads that as a writer are great jumping off points to to create other stories. Um, And he was doing this like dynamic, high sci-fi, you know, epic thing. And I am definitely doing a little more grounded, but also with a lot of mystery that's going to just be peeled back 
over and over and hopefully not like an onion so you're crying at the end but i mean just that or <laughs> we start uncovering things because you know i've seen people talking today it's like oh how how did you know how is his ring charged it's like that's a good question that we're going to explore <laughs> you know how you know what where are the guardians well i don't know i ha i have ideas uh you know there there's a lot of loose threads and what's great about it is talking with like philip who's doing the backup issue that's going to lead into his john stewart he's got some amazingly dynamic ideas and hopefully we both want to um, weave into each other on and off as we go forward but but right now it's about how on earth and and the consequences of quarantining 2814 and how they're separated from who were ostensibly his family. And just on a smaller level is just like, you want what you can't have in a way too. And it's like, yeah, he's Green Lantern and he's getting back in the groove. I Listen, I'm excited about being able to use Hal in a way that he gets to interact with heroes because I, I don't know the last time other than like the big, like, okay, dark crisis, here they are, but they're usually surrounded by other Green Lanterns. But like, I want to see him have a conversation with Ollie. I want to see him have a conversation with Barry. I want him to have kind of these interactions with other heroes because I'm a huge nerd. <laughs> and I, I want to play with the action figures, you know? It's like, he's on earth now. And, and, and it's just gonna, I think it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be interesting. And there's a lot of mystery involved. So hopefully people stick around long enough to kind of explore that or interested enough to explore it well let's talk about playing with the action figures because yeah. your flash run you know obviously it's a wally run and and you know you started off like with a very wally centric story but of yeah. course you know flash there's you know there's there's so many speed units uh speed <laughs> uh, what 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 is, what is uh, everywhere yeah what do they call them the biological conduits of the speed yeah, force yeah, right yeah yeah, yeah. There's so many of those around. It's inevitably going to become a Flash family book, right? But like you really built to that. Like by the time we got to One Minute War, which was like a real crescendo and like the honestly one of the best like big Flash family stories I've read in I don't know how long. Thank you. Do you see a similar track with Green Lantern where, you know, a year or two down the road, there are more of the familiar, especially the, the 2814 Green Lanterns yeah. all coming together in a big way, or are you not even, yeah. you're, you're just no, focused no, no, on making no. people I have a very long-term, I have a, unfortunately, because I'm weird like that, I have a very long-term plan, but you know, who knows, <laughs> you know, after issue one comes out and issue two craters and sales, <laughs> uh, I, I do have a, a, a a really long-term goal to a bigger story because I, you know, I definitely want to stay on earth for a while and I want to get us comfortable there. And I want to get us comfortable with Hal and hopefully guest stars and stuff. And then I want to start unraveling a lot of what's happening out there because, and I think it'll be that much more meaningful. I remember, you, do you remember when, you know, the, in Marvel, when the Illuminati sent the Hulk away, and I remember thinking, that is the coolest thing. He's gone. He's off the board for a year. And I thought the same thing in Justice League International when they like made Guy Gardner a pacifist for a long time. That sense of catharsis when we finally do open up the out outer sphere, you know, is I think going to be really cool if if everything I want to happen happens. <laughs> I mean, and, and you know, regardless, it's like I'm I'm super excited about these small moments and these character moments and stuff. And Zermanico is just killing it when it comes to that. Yes. Like he's doing it in a in a way that I mean, I knew he would because Flashpoint Beyond, every time he'd send back art, I was just like, oh my gosh, this guy's so good. But I can't wait to do some more bombastic things and more more things that I hope that he gets excited about. Not that he's not excited, I, I, he seems to be, but but I you know. You know, I want to push him too. I want to be like, oh, as I said, Zermanico is the ring. Like I get to create a construct by going like, I want it to be like this. And then he's like, you know, and he puts it out there. Um, so I don't have to use that much willpower, which is great. But it, it's it's exciting to see him bring his ability. And if you watch that guy's art career, it's just how I got lucky for him to be on, I'll never know, but uh, I'm very, very grateful. But yes, I want to move out, I, but I want to start start small and work big. I think it worked for The Flash. I think it's important as we do the dawn of DCU and that we're concentrating on one character 
it's going to make those other characters mean so much when we get when we bring them in and get to spend a little more time with them unless instead of them just being a nameless face in the crowd you know and you know if this is a little bit of a spoiler forgive me but is the goat okay for mission number one? <laughs> you know what? I you'll see. I think yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, I I thought it was I, so I, funny. I had written in there, and then and then Zermatico set the pages, and I like howled, and then I also felt kind of bad for the fictional goat. Uh, so you know. <laughs> well, yeah, I just need I I need goat. confirmation that uh, yeah, the goat no, is goat okay. Fine. Goats. I mean, listen. If you ever watch one of those Earth documentaries, you'll see like a goat fall off a cliff, and then they get up and they're like, "What's up?" You know, like they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> we get we have to move on to Flash in a minute, but I have one more GL question because it just goes right. back to something you said a couple minutes ago about people not liking how you right. know and. I wonder how much of that is because there have been definitive great Hal stories in the right. comics, you know, but there has never been a definitive Hal story in other media. Whereas with John, right. you know, like everybody loves John, not just from the comics, right. but because John was so amazing on, you know, justice league unlimited and, and, right. and things like that. Um, I know it's not, your fault and it's not really your <laughs> uh you know it's not really your your remit here but i just wonder like how much of that is just a matter of kind of perception you know where where yeah. how can be kind of um elevated again to the point that the character who is you know i mean look that was the action figure guy when i was a kid so yeah, yeah no listen i i mean whether it's a uh an unreal perceptive perception or not it's just a perception that is out there you know and i and it's something you have to contend with as a as a writer because you're like no this is the superhero this is a this is a good guy there's a reason the ring went to him and it's not just that he has tons of willpower um and i think it's it's a very important piece of the puzzle um to get people excited about this guy again again he's you know he always comes in and it's like, oh, look, it's Hal Jordan, the greatest Green Lantern, but I need to know why I care about that Green Lantern. Um, they did that really effectively with Kyle growing up. I was like, I get who this kid yes. is. Yes. You know, he's a guy that does art and blah, blah, blah. Um, I get it with Guy even. It's like, I hate him, but I love him, you know? Uh, and and so my goal is just to remind people why you should care about Hal. Because, uh, you know, originally when comics came out, there was a, it was very much like characters were just ciphers, right? They were square jawed, like, yes, I'm good at what I do, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so as we gotten older, you know, and the industry gotten older, the craft's gotten older, we've wanted to get a little more nuance in the character of him. And I just think Hal's very fascinating because, again, he is kind of, he can be a hothead, but he's also saved the universe countless times. He's, he's, He's worked for God, for goodness sake, <laughs> you know, like he has to have some a bigger perspective at this point in a, in a way. And I think when that bigger perspective juts up against your natural tendency to, you know, be, a, you know, hard, stubborn and, and, and willful, that makes for interesting drama. So we'll see. I also take back what I said about how not really being the best served in other media because you know what that green lantern animated series was way underrated uh, yeah and... see come on now you're right <laughs> that so... was my first credit in uh television and oh really yep and uh, i love that show it was it was such a fun show and i got to do two of them and it was fun jim krieg who's my mentor was running that show along with Giancarlo and ernie altbacker and i remember walking in the room and i remember them having the characters pinned up and over them they had like Captain Kirk was over uh, Hal. And I thought, oh, I get it. I get it now. I get who he is. That makes more sense. And they, and they, you know, obviously they, they did a little derivation on him, but, but um, I get who he is in that moment. So I want to, I kind of want to pursue that. I love, I love working on that series. And I think it is kind of the definitive Hal Jordan in my mind. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So scratch what I said before. What, yeah. what do I know? Never mind. But we should move on to yeah. a character that, you know, really looms large for me, you know, and that is Gold Beetle. 
Well, not oh, really, yeah. but I do love Gold Beetle like <laughs> so much. And I do want to talk about Gold Beetle, but um, you're about to finish up a substantial run with Wally with Wally West. Right. And I've kind of been calling this in my head. It's like the Wally West apology tour, you know, <laughs> where it's like Wally fans like me from from, you know, yeah. like like 80s and 90s kids that like really grew up with Wally. Yeah. Um, Kind of see Wally get. Wally's well, been kicked around a lot the right. last 15 years. Right. He's the pinata. Yeah. Yeah. When they asked me to take it over, it, my through line was like, I, and I told people at the beginning, you can look at everything I said at the beginning and go, as long as I'm writing him, he's going to be okay. <laughs> and, and it was just because he had, as a character, he had been uh, beaten up a little bit. And I found a lot of joy in taking that off the table and being like, what, what fun superhero stories can I just tell with this guy? And then as, as it went along, it was like, oh yeah, but his wife is really important to this scenario. And, and his kids are really important to this scenario. And his kid flash is important. Like just kept adding as the years went by and it, and it just deepened who Wally was, who I think is the, the most well-adjusted character in the DC universe. <laughs> and, uh, and part of that is because you know, as much as people say, oh, Jeremy retcon this stuff, it's like, maybe, but I also codified it as something that did happen and something that uh, real really took place and really hurt him emotionally and really was that trauma. And the idea of Wally being so hopeful that you can come out the other side, you just have to hold on. It's literally the first things I, I say in like the annual that I wrote, the first annual that I wrote, you know, you don't leave until the miracle happens. And when somebody in my experience, life experiences, when I've met somebody that has gone through horrific circumstances and are still somehow able to stand upright and operate, uh, they become heroic to me. And so it was a great opportunity to highlight the fact that Wally was able to overcome those things and have this amazing family and have this amazing extended family. And it was just, I mean, gosh, it was just such a thrill to be able to write him and, and write him for as long as I was able to. And you followed, you know, you're following Josh Williamson on the book, who yep. wrote one of the definitive Barry runs, as far as I'm concerned, you know, and you're joining a pantheon of like serious Wally writers, you know, from, yeah. I mean, you know, go back to, to Mike Barron and Bill Messner Loeb's and, and, you know, never mind like Mark Wade and yeah, Jim yeah, yeah. Johns. And, yeah. um, so, and I got to confess, I came late to your flash run because yeah. after Joshua wrapped and I was like, you know what? I have read nearly every flash comic published in my lifetime. <laughs> I've read enough flash for a while. Like I don't need this. And then people start telling me how good this Wally book is. So, yeah. so I dove in and it's fantastic, yeah. but I want to know, like, is there to you a fundamental, like obviously character wise, Wally and Barry are very different. Yeah. But is there like a, a difference to you between like a Barry story and a Wally story, or is yeah, that something I, that doesn't matter? And it's just character that drives it. No, no, no. Well, I don't know. I just think of Wally as much more emotional as, as and Barry's much more intellectual. I think Wally at this point has a much uh, bigger perspective on the universe in a way he's, he's gone through some serious stuff, man. Uh, but, but that's just because I've been writing him that way too. It's like, I'm taking all the stuff and I, and I say it in a couple of monologues that, that Wally gives It's like, he was on, you know, the Mobius chair. He has done all these cosmic things that people forget about. So he has kind of a bigger perspective. I think Barry can be isolated in intellectualism. And, um, as you see at the beginning of one minute war, Iris is like, Hey, listen, your, your sidekicks moved on. <laughs> What's going on with us? So that was, uh, uh, I think he, but then when he's aware of it, I think he moves on it, but I, I but, but Barry is very logical. Uh, but, but so, so it's not that the stories are different. It's just that the, re the way the stories are different is because the characters approach the story differently, you know? So I can do whatever the MacGuffin is. Like if, if, the if the scythe that like turns you know draws people bad that was containing eclipso early on landed and it was barry that found it he would he wouldn't be cracking jokes like wally would he would probably be more along the lines of mr terrific like we don't need to touch this we need to make sure you know he would be much 
more direct why wally's just like well listen you know this is crazy you know <laughs> stuff like that so i don't know oh, i do like it's funny that you say like for for as as logical and controlled as barry is right barry's the one who has not settled down or had not at that point right whereas like while like it's like wally well, he's got a brood man yeah. family guy yeah 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 i mean that yeah <clears throat> that was one, one of the reasons i wanted to give him another kid was mainly because the trope of having twins, I, you know, it's a trope. And I was like, usually superheroes stop at one or two. And I'm like, I don't know if any of them have three, you know? And it was just like, eh, this is a little different dynamic. And the idea behind it was like, oh man, it'll be so funny to see Wally handle a baby, you know? Like, you know, that that's hysterical. There's a lot of stories to be told there. So uh, yeah, yeah, Wally's awesome. <laughs> when are we getting more Gold Beetle? Oh my gosh. Because I love her. I love her too. I love her too. Uh, issue seven ninety nine comes out next week, and uh, and she she'll be in that because she was just in seven ninety eight, and she is this thing that I've you know she was in my first run of comics I've ever did in the 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 Shazam that was how she was introduced in Shazam one you know DC one million future state, and her story and her origin is something that I hope to dole out over many decades. <laughs> really. <laughs> I just, I just love that she is out of time, out of sync. She does such bizarro things, but she knows a lot. She is my version of, you know, Matt Smith and David Tennant smashed together, you know, in the DC universe. It's my firm belief that it is Gold Beetle that rectifies and fixes continuity whenever there's problems. Even if it's like an, an accidental uh, coloring issue in a comic, I'm like, yeah, Gold Beetle fix that. Don't worry you know <laughs> <laughs> i i love too how you approached i mean like it's interesting like at, at one point it's like i think it, i think it's it's barry who says that like we have weird continuity i think that's the first time i've ever heard the word continuity used in story <laughs> as a yeah. you know what i mean without yeah. it being like obviously there's a meta element to it, but without right. it being like a looking at the reader right. and right. saying it kind of way. Um, and you have a couple of moments like that, yeah. you know, where you're you're kind of acknowledging that uh, you know, that Morrisonian view of of superhero right. storytelling, but without trying to, you know, without trying to like do a bit with it, I guess is right, the way right, to say right. it. I, I think speedsters, like my my belief is that speedsters, people connected to the speed force are aware of continuity shifts. Even if it's like memories or dreams or whatever, they're aware that it's changed. And we taught, we there's a mention of it um, that Mr. Terrific makes in Flashpoint Beyond to Miss um, Baxter. And it was like, and it's like, it's brief. It's like, yeah, we all know our memories memories have changed because of whatever and so i think especially some of them that are more connected probably have a better idea that's why i you know jay garrick in um dark or one of the lead-ins to dark crisis he sees linda in the costume and he says judy and it's like yep. he's having that that moment because there's no reason he should know who she is because she has been taken out of time if you are reading star girl but he does recognize something there subconsciously. So, and I think with Barry, it's probably even greater because he remembered their relationship with Iris. And even when he touched uh, Wally, when Wally returned from the Speed Force and Williamson's rung, there was like an instant recollection. And I think the same thing, but I think Wally absolutely remembers things changing and absolutely remembers other versions of, of the universe. Let's talk about Jay for a second because you have a Jay Garrett book yeah. on the way in october the book is called jay garrick the flash it is out october 17th you know jeff had jeff johns had this great new golden age uh idea that's going to wrap into the dawn of dcu you know you have venditti sandman you have tim sheridan's alan scott you have my uh jay garrick that you know he came to me and he's like hey do you want to explore this 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 new daughter you know that comes into jay's life and it and it is and of course, like I said to you earlier, I'm the Mikey of you know comic books. So you want me to write something, I'm going to write it. Uh, and I have a daughter myself, so the so trying to get in the headspace of something of like, okay, we have another speedster. Why should we care, you know? And but also 
I'm a dad and the idea that I forgot about my daughter and then suddenly she shows up. Ooh, that's tough. That's tough to even like remotely think about and leading to greater mysteries uh, in that, that series that I think are going to have long ranging effects in the DC universe, um, which is exciting because the other guys, you know, Robert and, and Tim's books are all take place in the past. Mine takes place in the present with flashbacks, but you know, it's going to be a great way to explore Jay Garrick and his wife, Joan, to a degree, who thought they never could have kids. Um, and that was a defining feature of Jay Garrick that people really loved. And now that has been kind of changed because now you have a kid. But how do you do that? How do you, how do you, you know, it's one thing to be a grandparent. You can wind up a kid and then send them back home. This is like, you know, this is your kid that you forgot about in a world that is not like the 1940s, you know? So there's gonna be a lot of fun to be had, but there's also gonna be some old villains that are going to see their chance to capitalize on things they had tried many, many years ago. So that'll be interesting too. Your J in One Minute War. Right. He's a hard man, dude. Like, <laughs> like that's a very different J than I think we've become accustomed to. But it makes sense. I mean, you know, he's kind of like greatest generation J, right? Right. Um, what what else can you? Is there anything else that you could tell everybody about your approach to Jay Garrick? And like, this is a character, you know, who has to be so distinct from Wally and from Barry. And, you know, can't just be the kindly, you know, grandfatherly, you know, mentor yeah. flash figure. So how, how did you come to this? I just love Jay in general. So I'm really hyped. He is a very direct representation of my grandfather, my mom's side, who was in World War II and an incredible hero, two purple hearts, like tons of. And I remember my grandfather, big, just hulking guy, didn't didn't look like it because he was, he was a farmer. And I remember him taking off his shirt and this giant scar from the back of his shoulder all the way down to his, uh, his hip from shrapnel. And I was like, uh, you know, what happened there? You know, and it's like, oh yeah, it was a bomb. And I was in, you know, in the war and this happened. He didn't talk about it much, but what I had found out is he had got the shrapnel, um, you know, recovered in the hospital for a couple of weeks and then immediately back to the front lines in a way. And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is Rambo. And I and and that's how I look at Jay. He's a very kindly. There's a lot of these guys out there, a lot of Vietnam vets and war vets that are they're very kindly, they're very polite, they'll they will give advice and stuff. And and I think he recognizes they're in a different world. He's the guy that's like, okay, you know, we're we're gonna punch bad guys and stuff like that. But like in one minute war, it's like, well, this is war. So I'm gonna use my tooth to kill this guy so I can, you know. Not that he killed him, but you know he's he's not playing for he's not playing patty cake because he's been through this. This is a different set of circumstances. Um, Jay is somebody who's been alive for a long time and seen a lot of change. And I think the way I'm approaching it is here's a guy that has seen a lot of change, and now he has a daughter that is from a, a more quote unquote innocent time. I think it's going to be really difficult for him. And really, you know, you think about being a helicopter parent. Now you add the speed force to that. And uh, that's going to, you know, that's going to provide some both hilarity and also tension between their relationship. All right. Well, we have hit the past, the present and the future, the near future of your uh, of your recent DC work. So thank you so much, Jeremy. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's always good talking to you. And that is it for this week's DC stand -Em. Don't forget to check out our web home at dennygeek.com where you can find all our DC coverage at dennygeek.com slash DC. Drop us a line at DC stand on Twitter and Instagram. Give those a follow because, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll have some surprises there. But if nothing else, let us know what you want to see and hear about in upcoming episodes. And hey, did you know that we also have a Marvel show? That's right. You can also listen to Marvel stand -Em wherever you're listening to this show right now. So check it out. Sometimes we do our stand live. So make sure you follow Den of Geek on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Den of Geek TV. This has been DC stand on the Den of Geek Network. Until next time, I'm Mike Cicchini. And remember, folks, 
we stand together.